at anchor. In the failing light, the boat approached a bend that led into a wide channel. The far shore, several kilometers away, had already been obscured, but in midstream something lay anchored that seemed to suggest a floating stockade. Fetching her binoculars, Pia saw that this object was actually a cluster of six fishing boats, similar in size and design to the one she was in. The boats were tied tightly together, side by side, and they were tethered against the current by a battery of ropes. Although they were more than a kilometer away, her binoculars provided a clear view of the cruisemen as they went about their business. Some were sitting alone, smoking beaties. Others were drinking tea or playing cards. A few were washing clothes and utensils, drawing water from the river in steel buckets. A boat in the center of the cluster was sending up puffs of smoke, and she guessed that this was where the communal dinner was being cooked. The sight was both familiar and puzzling. She was reminded of riverside hamlets on the Mekong and their irrawity. There too, at the approach of nightfall, time had seemed to both accelerate and stand still, with lazy spirals of smoke rising into the twilight while ba bathers came hurrying down the banks to wash off the day's dust. But the difference here was that this village had taken leave of the shore and tethered itself in midstream. Why? Catching sight of the boats, Tutul gave a shout and launched into an animated conversation with his father. She could tell that they had recognized the boat in the little flotilla. Perhaps they belonged to friends or relatives? She had spent enough time on rivers to know that the people who lived on their shores were rarely strangers to each other. It was almost a certainty that Fokir and his son knew the people in that floating hamlet and that they would be welcome there. It was easy to imagine how, for them, this might well be the best possible conclusion to the day, an opportunity to mull over the day's events and to show off the stranger who had landed in their midst. Maybe this had been the plan all along, to anchor here with their friends. As the boat rounded the bend, she became convinced of this and found herself thinking of the hours that lay ahead. She had long experience of such encounters, having been on many rivers, uh, river surveys where the days ended in unforeseen meetings of this kind. She knew what would follow, the surprise that would be occasioned by her presence, the questions, the explanations, the words of welcome she didn't understand but would have to respond with enforced good humor. The prospect dismayed her, not because of any concern for her own safety, she knew she had nothing to fear from these fishermen, but because for the moment all she wanted to be in all she wanted was to be in this boat, in this small island of silence, afloat on the muteness of the river. It was all she could do to restrain herself from appealing to Fokir to keep on going, to hug the shore and keep their boat well hidden. Of course, none of this could have been said, not even if she had had the words, and it was precisely because nothing was said that she was taken by surprise when she saw the boat's bow turning in the direction she had hoped for. Fokir was steering them away from the floating hamlet, slipping by along the shadows of the shore. She did not betray her relief by any outward alteration of her stance, and nor did her practiced hands failed to keep her binoculars fixed to her eyes, but inside it was as though there were a child leaping to celebrate an unexpected treat. Shortly after the last flicker of daylight had faded, Fokir pulled the boat over and dropped anchor in, a, in the channel that ebb tide had turned into a sheltered creek. It was clear that they could not have gone much further that night and yet there was something about his manner that told Pia that he was disappointed, that he had decided on another spot in which to anchor, and was annoyed with himself for not having reached it. But now that they were at anchor, with the surprise of the day behind them, a sense of un unhurried lassitude descending on the, descended on the boat. 
Fokir put a match to an oil blackened lamp and lit a beady from the flame. After he had smoked it down to a stub, he went aft and showed Pia by indication and gesture how the squared platform at the stern end of the boat could be screened off for use as a lavatory and bathroom. By way of example, he drew a bucket of water and proceeded to bathe Tutu, using the brackish water of the river to soap him and dipping sparsely into a fresh water canister to wash off the suds. With the setting of the sun, the night had turned chilly and the boy's teeth chatted as he stood dripping on deck. Producing a checkered cloth, Fokir rubbed him down before bundling him into his clothes. This towel was made of reddish cotton and was one of several similar pieces Pia had seen around the boat. They had stirred a faint sense of recognition, but she could not recall where from. Once Tutul was done with dressing, it was his turn to bathe his father. After Fokir had stripped down to his breech cloth, Tutul upended streams of cold water over his head to the accompaniment of much laughter and many loud yells. Pia could see the bones of Fokir's chest pushing against his skin like the ribs of a tin can that had been stripped of its label. The water made patterns around him, sluicing off the contours of his body as though it were tumbling down the tears of a fountain. When both father and son were finished, it was Pia's turn. A bucket load of water was pulled up and the shelter was screened off with the sari. In the confines of the boat, it was no easy matter to change places. It was impossible for all three of them to be on their feet at the same time, so they had to lie prone and squirm through the hooped hood in a jumble of elbows, hips, and bellies, with Fokir holding down his lunge to prevent from riding up. As they were wriggling past each other, Pia caught his eye and they both laughed. Pia emerged at the far end to find the river glowing like quicksilver. All but the brightest of the stars had been obscured by the moon, and apart from their one lamp, no other light was to be seen, either on land or on the water. Nor was there any sound other than the lapping of the water for the shore was so distant that even the insects, insects of the forest were inaudible. Except at sea, she had never known the human trace to be so faint, so close to undetectable. Yet on looking around her tiny bathroom, she discovered by the yellow light of the lamp that amenities far beyond her expectations had been provided. There was a half canister of fresh water and next to it a bucket filled with the brackish water of the river. There was a cake of soap on the ledge and beside it a tiny but astonishing ob object, a plastic sachet of shampoo. She had seen strings of these dangling in the tea shops in Canon, and yet when she picked it up to examine it, its presence seemed oddly intrusive. She would have liked to throw it away except she knew that here on the island that this was boat that the island that this boat the sachet was a treasure of a kind bought at the expense of how many crabs and that it had been put here in her honor to throw it away would be to abuse this offering so even though she had never felt less inclined to use shampoo she put a little bit of it in her hair and washed it into the water hoping that they would see from the bubbles flowing past the blow, the bow, that she had accepted the gift and put it to use. Only when it was too late and she was shivering against the chill, squatting on the wet boards and hugging her knees, did she remember that she had no towel nor anything else with which to, with, with which to dry herself. But a further search revealed that even this had been provided for. One of those rectangle, rectangles of checkered cloth had been left draped on the bamboo awning for her use. It was already dry, which suggested it had been there for some time. When she touched it to pick it up, she had an intuition that this was what Fokira had been wearing when he dived in after her. These lengths of cloth served many purposes, she knew. 
And when she put it to her nose, she had the impression that she could smell, along with the tartness of the sun and the metallic muddiness of the river, the salty scent of his sweat. Now she recalled where it was she had seen a towel like this before. It was tied to the doorknob of her father's wardrobe in the eleventh floor apartment of her childhood. Through the years of her adolescence, the fabric had grown old and tattered and she would have thrown it away but, her father's, but for her father's protests. He was, in general, the least sentimental of men, especially where it concerned home. Where others sought to preserve their mem memories of the old country, he had always tried to expunge them. His feet were in the present, he had liked to say, by which he meant they were planted firmly on the rungs of his company's career ladder. But when she had asked whether she could throw away that rotting bit of old cloth, he had responded almost with shock. It had been with him for many years, he said. It was almost part of his body, like his hair or his nail clippings. His luck was woven into it. He could not think of parting with it, of throwing away this. What was it called? What was it he had called it? She had known the word once, but time had erased it from her memory. Kusum From the far side of the guest house roof, Kanayu could see all the way across the island to the Hamilton High School, and even beyond to the spot where Nirmal's house had once stood. It was gone now, but the image of it that flickered in his memory was no less real to him than the newly constructed student hostel that had taken its place. Although the house had always been referred to as a bungalow, its size, design, and proportions were those of a cabin. Its walls and floors were made of wood and nowhere was a brick or a single smudge of cement to be seen. The structure, held up by a set of stumpy little stilts, stood a foot or so off the ground. As a result, the floors were uneven and their tilt tended to vary with the seasons dipping during the rains when the ground turned soggy and firming up in the dry winter months. The bungalow had only two proper rooms, of which one was a bedroom while the other was a kind of study used by both Nirmal and Nilama. A cot was rigged up in the study for Kanai, and like the big bed, it was enclosed in a permanent canopy of heavy netting. Mosquitoes were the least of the creatures this net was intended to exclude. Its absence at any time, night or day, would have been an invitation for snakes and scorpions to make their way between the sheets. In a hut by the pond, a woman was even said to have found a large dead fish in her bed. This was a koimcha, or tree perch, a species known to be able to manipulate its tiny, its spiny fins in such a way as to drag itself off ground for short distances. It had found its way into the bed only to suffocate on the mattress. To preclude nighttime collapses of the mosquito netting, the bindings were checked and retied every evening. The tied country being what it was, there were twists even to this commonplace household chore. Once, soon after the, she first came to Lucy Bari, Nilima had made the mistake of trying to put up the net in near darkness. The only light was from a candle placed on a window sill at the other end of the room. Being short as well as very short-sighted, she could not see exactly what her fingers were doing as they knotted the net to the bed's bamboo poles. Even when she stood on tiptoe, the strings were far above her head. Suddenly, one of the strings had come alive. 
to the accompaniment of a sharp hiss. It had snapped a whip-like tail across the palm of her hand. She had snatched her arm back just in time to see a long, thin-shaped dropping from the pole. She had caught a glimpse of it before it wriggled under the door. It was an extremely venomous arboreal snake that inhabited the upper branches of some of the more slender mangroves. In the poles of the mosquito net, it had evidently found a perch much to its liking. At night, lying on his cot, Kanai would imagine that the roof had come alive. The thatch would rustle and shake and there would be frantic little outbursts of squeals and hisses. From time to time, there would be loud plops as creatures of various kinds fell to the floor. Usually, they would go shooting off again and slip away under the door, but every once in a while, Kanai would wake up in the morning and find a dead snake or a clutch of birds' eggs lying on the ground, providing a feast for any army of beetles and ants. At times, these creatures would fall right into the bed's netting, weighing it down in the middle and shaking the, the posts. When this happened, you had to take your pillow, shut your eyes, and give the net a whack from below. Often the creature, whatever it was, would go shooting off into the air and that was the last you'd see of it. But sometimes it would just go straight up and land right back in the net and then you'd have to start all over again. At the back of the bungalow was an open courtyard where the meetings of the Lucy Bari Women's Union were held. At the time of Kanai's banishment to Lucy Bari in 1970, the union was a small, improvised affair. Several times a week, the union's members would gather in the courtyard to work on income-generating projects, knitting, sewing, dyeing yarn, and so on. But the members also used these occasions to talk and give vent to their anger and grief. These outbursts were str strangely disquieting, and in the beginning, Kanai went to great lengths to stay away from the bungalow when the union was in session there. But that too was not without its pitfalls, for he had no friends in Lusibari, and nowhere in particular to go. When he encountered children of his age, they seemed simple-minded, silent, or inexplicably hostile. Knowing that his suspension from school would be over in a few weeks, he felt no compulsion to unbend towards these rustics. After twice being attacked with stones thrown by unseen hands, Kanai decided that he might be better off inside the bungalow than outside. And soon enough, from the safety of the study, he was eavesdropping avidly on the exchanges in the courtyard. It was at one of those meetings that Kanai first saw Kusum. She had a chipped front tooth and her hair was cut short, making her something of an oddity among the girls of the island. Here, her head had been shaved the year before, after an attack of typhoid. She had only narrowly survived and was still treated as an invalid. It was for this reason that she was allowed to while away her time at the union's meetings. It was possibly for this reason also that she was still in her mid-teens, dressed in the frilly frock of a child instead of a woman's sari. Or perhaps it was simply in order to wring a few more months' wear out of a set of still usable clothes. One day, during a meeting in the courtyard, a woman began to recount a story in exceptionally vivid detail. One night, when her husband was away on a boat, her father-in-law had come home drunk and forced his way into the room where she was sleeping with her children. In front of her children, he had held the sharpened edge of the da to her throat and tried to pull off her sari. When she attempted to fight him off, he had gashed her arm with a machete, almost severing the thumb of her left hand. She had flung a kerosene lamp at him and his lungy had caught fire, giving him severe burns. For this, she had been turned out of her marital home, although her only offense was that she had tried to protect herself and her children. Here. As if to corroborate her story, her voice rose and she cried out, And this is where he cut me, here and here. 
At this point, Kanai, unable to restrain his curiosity, thrust his head through the doorway to steal a glance. The woman who had told the story was hidden from his view, and since everyone in the courtyard was looking in her direction, no one noticed Kanai. No one, that is, but Kusum, who had averted her eyes from the storyteller. Kanai and Kusum held each other's gaze, and for the duration of that moment, it was as though they were staring across the most pri primeval divide in creation, each assessing the dangers that lay on the other side. It seemed scarcely imaginable that here, in the gap that separated them, lay the potential for these extremes of emotion, this violence. But the mystery of it was that the result of this assessment was nothing so simple as fear or revulsion. What he saw in her eyes was rather an awakened curiosity he knew to be a reflection of his own. So far as Kanai could remember, it was Kusum who spoke to him first, not on that day but on some other morning. He was sitting on the floor wearing nothing but a pair of khaki shorts. He had his back against a wall with a book on his belly, its spine propped up against his knees. He looked up from the page to see her peering through the doorway, a strangely self-possessed figure despite her close-cropped hair and tattered red frock. Scowling at him, she said in a tone of querulous accusation, What are you doing here? Reading. I saw you are listening. So, he shrugged, I'll tell. So go and tell. Despite the show of bravado, he was rattled by the threat. As if to keep her from carrying it out, he moved up to make room for her to sit. She sank down and sat beside him with her back to the wall and her knees drawn up to her chin. Although he didn't dare look at her too closely, he became aware that their bodies were grazing each other at the shoulder, the elbows, the hips, and the knees. Presently he saw that there was a mole on the swell of her left breast. It was very small, but he could not tear his eye from it. Show me a book, she said. Kanai was reading an English mystery, mystery story, and he dismissed her quest with a shrug. Why do you want to look at this book? It won't make any sense to you. Why not? Do you know English? Can I demand? No. Then, why are you asking? She watched him for a moment, unabashed, and then, sticking her fist under his nose, unfurled her fingers. Do you know what this is? Can I saw that she had a grasshopper in her hand and his lip curled in contempt? Those are everywhere. Who's not seen one of those? Look. Lifting up her hand, Kusum put the insect in her mouth and closed her lips. This caught Kanai's attention and he finally deigned to lower his book. Did you swallow it? Suddenly her lips sprang apart and the grasshopper jumped straight into Kanai's face. He let out a shout and fell over backwards while she watched, laughing. It's just an insect, she said. Don't be afraid. 